Thank you so much, Miles. So as you were speaking, it occurred to me, you were talking about these laws of survival, and they're found all over the world, and it occurred to me that some of the remnants actually still exist in the English language too. Can we just try a quick experiment? Don't put all your eggs. What goes up? Don't kill the goose. So these concepts are not unfamiliar to us, but we live under a colonial law that's administered by an elected government. So how do we reconcile those fundamental laws of survival and our legal system that we have to live in as political beings? That's the first question I have. Could take us all night. No, I just answered it. The, <laughs> we, Peter, we, David? We start with uh, establishing the constitutional right to a healthy environment, which indicates, which establishes in law you know, you know in, in a market economy, there's two, I don't know, there's two ways to cause action. Well, you can use moral suasion, too. You can convince people to change their habits voluntarily. But you've got, um, you can price uh, unacceptable behavior, or you can regulate it. We need to establish as a basis in our law that uh, clean air, water, and soil are the status quo. That's not the case today. You know, if somebody wants to pipe, put a pipeline in my backyard from Alberta to, to where I dig clams, I've got to prove that they're going to harm me. And when I go into their forums, they tell me I have no standing to make my arguments. Hell with that. <laughs> you know, they're... A simple first step is to put in our constitution from a people's movement that clean air, water, and soil are our beginning point and we deal with things from there, according to all those laws you just cited. <laughs> Peter, what's your, what's your response to the challenge that Miles is throwing down? Uh, I think I'll just move a little further away before I... <laughs> <laughs> For me, the... The tough part is going from the grand principle, I mean, who, who could not want clean air, clean water, and clean land, to how you would implement that in practice. Typically what we do is we have to come up with some scientific definition of what, what counts as clean, what levels of concentration of different contaminants that are permitted. And uh, so, it's, so, so I don't want to in any way demean the, the, the importance of the basic principles, but, but that's the sort of the first step. That, there's really tough work after that, which says, okay, well, how do we define clean in a way that if you're going to go through the, the court system, can stand up in court, if you want to use an economic instrument so that you impose a charge on someone's behavior, which is making something you want clean unclean, again, you need, you need careful definitions. To, to make that happen. And I, and I said in my, um, in my comments, which I don't know how anybody could remember them after we heard Miles's great speech, but anyway, one of the things I said was, uh, we often don't get the science we need to implement or to, to aid the decisions we want, we want to make. And this is the kind of example where to come down to a, a scientific or the scientific information we need to talk about the different levels of contamination and the effects they have so that if we want to use a pricing system to help regulate the behavior, we can, we can calibrate it because otherwise we're just talking in sort of theoretical principles, but we need, we need more than that for practical policy. is like a board meeting. David used to be on the board of the David Suzuki Foundation and Peter's also on the board. But Peter also, as well as those, that change in, sure, you got to measure and it's onerous and it, it, it brings capacity issues. But we've also got to change our institutions and the e economic system, this um, um, capitalist system, has skewed decision making away from people in their homes to, some, to global conglomerates. And you know, we've got to bring back more of that decision making power to the places where people call home, because they're the ones who care about these places. And it, it, it's going to reduce the... Don't worry, economists won't be out of jobs. You will, they'll, they'll still be technical <laughs> things for economists to do, but... It'll, um, but if you, if, if you put at the local level, like, like what we have at the provincial and national level, some of those powers to, 
to approve activities. You know, it, admittedly, it's going to cut down. We're not going to have as robust. Who knows? I mean, we're, people are pretty smart. People are pretty adaptable. We might not have the huge levels of wealth. You know, so so we got lots of room to move. How much of it? How much of it is concentrated right at the top? Yeah, let me, so we can work that out, but I said it, we got to change our institutions also and bring some of that power back down to the people in their place. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I also want to make the observation that in my experience, you can have a much more sensible, informed discussion about these various issues at the local level than you get as you move up through the different levels of government. Uh, I deal with a lot of different governments and I find the municipal governments understand the notion of limits because they have to deal with waste, they have to deal with water supply, uh, they have to deal with people who are rather content with the way they live and don't want to see more growth. You move up to the provincial level, there's less sympathy for that and of course the federal level, um, you can't even get, get the discussion going. So I, I agree with you, there's much more that could be done but here's the dilemma. More and more of the problems that we're having because of the pressure our economies are putting on the biosphere are happening at the global level. And, and that's where there's this huge vacuum in the capacity of, of our human society to make sensible decisions at the global level. And I'd really like, I mean, I really like the, 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 the parallel or the example you were giving us about how uh, your community on Haida Gwaii saw its circumstances and used that to guide the decision making. How do you translate that to the global level? How do you make that work at the global level? Well, I, you know, 150 years ago, that, glo that global level didn't, for practical reasons, exist. Yeah, but it does now. And, you know, that, that's, and it does today. But it's also got opportunities. You know, everything cuts both ways. You know, we, we've got to... to um, use our ability to communicate and interact with each other and move and interact at, at that global level, take advantage of that. And, but I think really seriously, the, the way to do that, and it's a fairly drastic measure compared to the way we're, do, we're doing things now, but simply to move that, not all of the decision making, I mean, it's a delicate mix. We've got to have more power over resource over our relationship to the rest of creation at the at people in their, in their homes. But we've also got to be able to come together at a provincial or a, or a national level and a global level and communicate and take advantage of opportunities at that level. Um, can, I, can I jump in and ask David how your perspective has changed getting involved with the grassroots community organizing that we've seen from the Blue Dot Tour and even the other day, I saw you speaking to a group of Lead Now volunteers in a, a church basement in Ontario. Where does that fit into the conversation about the kind of system change that we're talking about? Well, first of all, I think, to me, the highest priority I have is to do everything I can as one citizen to make sure that Mr. Harper doesn't get back into power. Because this, uh, no, I, I, this is an absolutely critical time. We don't have a democracy. He had, well, I don't want to go through the list of, of things. If you go to the Taiyi, you've got the 70 egregious things that Mr. Harper has done. You've got Mel Hertig's book, The Arrogant uh, Whatever It Is. And the, the list of what he has done to undermine democracy is, is incredible. And I, I happen to believe very much in our democracy, and I think we've suffered enormously over that uh, the last 10 years under uh, Mr. Harper. So that's number one, but I think what I find is the response at the grassroots level to an idea like a constitutional amendment has been enormous. I would never have imagined it could start and, and take off as it has. Whether or not we get the amendment in the end is not as important as the discussion that's going on. I mean, there was a very robust discussion at the Union of BC Municipalities. There were communities like Williams Lake that said, look, we have you know, forestry is a big issue in our, uh, in, in our city. How can we possibly support this? Uh, and and uh, 60 percent of the uh, municipalities voted to send the resolution up to the, the premier. I mean, this is the way you get things done. I want to open up the discussion now to include two practitioners, two people who grapple with the realities and the trade-offs of what we call the green economy every day. 
and one of whom is also accountable to, to voters as a municipal politician. So I want to bring up Marin Smith from uh, Clean Energy Canada and Andrea Reimer from the city of Vancouver to talk a little bit about... Do you want to grab those chairs over there? So you deal with this stuff in the ground level. Can you tell us how, how we're making progress in enacting some of the philosophical shifts that we're hearing describing, and what are the biggest barriers to that? Oh, small question. Thanks, Kai. Um, so uh, my name is Andrea Reimer. I'm deputy mayor here in Vancouver, and I did want to echo the acknowledgement um, of the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Um, and to say that, um, you know, I was reflecting as you were talking that reconciliation is a very important issue for the city of Vancouver. And I was thinking about, you know, this talking about there's no jobs on a dead planet. That's how that's how they said it when I was a kid. Um, and but thinking about for us, there's also, even if we can solve the environmental problems, if we can't find a way to stop the past from crippling the future of our relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, we also haven't succeeded. So, so it's very, it, it means a lot to us to recognize the territory. It means more to us to get the welcome. So I wanted to thank Kansi uh, for, for having this dialogue tonight. Um, I have been called many things in my time. I, I get deputy mayor, counselor, I was a school trustee, the first elected for the Green Party. I've got a kid at home who calls me mom. I play soccer, so people say all sorts of things on the field to me. Um, had a cabinet minister call me an idiot one time uh, on the occasion of bringing a motion forward to recognize the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. I have never been called a green economy practitioner, and I, I have to think I sort of got here a bit by accident for all of the reasons that you were all talking about and Neela was talking about and Kai has talked about. Um, I just wanted Vancouver to be the greenest city in the world. Um, it seemed fairly straightforward to me. If the problem is that the world is falling apart because we're failing to address these fundamental ecological things, then let's address these fundamental ecological things as well as we possibly can. Um, and recognizing though that, and I think, I, I haven't actually heard you guys speak as much to this as I expected to, that it can't be business as usual over here on all of these structures and then also doing green over here, that you have to sort of change everything about everything that you're doing if you really want it to be sustainable at a fundamental level. So that isn't a technology challenge, it's not an economy challenge, it's not a, it's not a thing challenge, it's just social challenge. It's about the story that we're telling ourselves. And we have this story um, in British Columbia and Vancouver, in large parts of Canada that we are hewers of wood, we are carriers of water, we dig things, and we are a colony of empires, either British or, or American or, or wherever. Um, and that we can't really get things done on our own. And the reality is only 1% of our jobs are about hewing, digging, carrying, piping things, uh, and only 3% of our GDP. So then why is it we tell ourselves this ridiculous story about who we are? Because the reality is we're all the things that you talked about. We are these incredible entrepreneurs. We are the most deeply rooted dreamers. The, the stories that you're telling about Haida Gwaii, about the Stein, I mean, those were... Those were not easy thoughts when they were thought, that these could be saved, protected, that cultures could, could be lifted up and, and be the cultures that they are there now. And yet all of these things have happened because we are so incredibly tenacious about finding where we want to go and getting there. And that's not about hewing or caring or digging or piping. It's certainly not about being dependent on somebody else. So I think from my perspective as a newly minted green economy practitioner, um, I think it really is about how we can create the story of ourselves that changes the sense of who we are and why I'm so grateful for people like David and Miles and Peter Kai, you, you played a big role in this as well, about telling this story about not just who we can be, but actually who we are and where the potential of that is moving forward. Thank you. <laughs> Marin, you've done a lot of work in shifting that story. Can you tell us where we're at and where we're going next? Well, that's also a big directive. Uh, let me give it a try. Um, I guess I also want to acknowledge that um, I'm feeling pretty good being called a green economy practitioner. It was in the script. <laughs> um, I'm actually a biologist and uh, you know, went to school to try to figure out how to protect the environment, inspired by people like David, 
um, lived here in Vancouver, smelt the pulp mill up the Sunshine Coast, was sure that there had to be something bad about that stinky thing and the fact that the crab started disappearing was a sign too. You know, went to university, discovered that after I did my little science experiment and all the copepods died, and then I went to the stacks, remember in the days when there were stacks, and found all the research that frankly they knew that the copepods would die and the fish would die, the snails, etc. Like, they knew all this and it had nothing to do with science. You know, decisions weren't being made on science as has been referenced by David. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about economy, economics, even though I'm not really an economist, and numbers and investment. You know, my, what drives me is um, protecting the world from climate change. And so we're working to accelerate the transition to a clean energy economy. So I'm gonna start with some good news. Um, last year, carbon emissions plateaued globally for the first time in decades, even though the economy grew. And so, why? The, according to the International Energy Agency, it's because of renewable energy and energy efficiency caused the emissions to plateau, so it works. And for me, that gives me hope. We can, we can fight climate change. We can make it work. Um, so there's a second piece of good news. Last year, $295 billion was invested in renewable electricity globally. That is twice the amount that was invested in fossil fuels globally, uh, in fossil fuel electricity projects. So it's not only working to fight climate change, but it's actually good business, and people are putting their money there. And partly it's because the price of these things has dropped enormously. So the cost of solar has plunged over 85% in the past five years, and it keeps going down. Cost of wind has done the same. So this is now affordable. Solar can compete in 30 countries in the world already, and the prices keep going down. So this is good business. So if you're an economist who wants to make money, you're a business guy, this isn't a boutique industry anymore. This isn't a niche industry. This, you don't do this because it's morally the right thing to do. You can put in place clean energy and make money. And that's what we need to do if we're going to shift out this economy so it's not powered by fossil fuels, but it's powered by clean energy. Um, and David referenced another huge piece of good news from last year, and that's the tone change. The fact that Obama and uh, China reached an agreement, and frankly, Obama has been creating climate cooperation agreements with China, with the United, uh, sorry, with Mexico, uh, with India. India is now committed to power every home and has committed to a huge solar um, industry. And we talked about the Pope. Everyone's talking about the Pope. So th there's a tone change. Suddenly, what we can do and what is happening in the world, this is no longer something that we can't talk about. And so just to then bring it closer to home, just to, to wrap here is, you know, we, we, we talked about how Harper doesn't want us to act on climate change because it's going to wreck the economy. And so, you know, how do you think we're doing here? How many jobs do we have in clean energy in Canada, do you think? Throw out some numbers. I'll throw out some numbers of what people have said to me when I ask them this. You know, let, let's compare it to the oil sands. How many direct jobs in the oil sands versus how many direct jobs in clean energy? One-tenth, one-one-hundredth, one-half? Well, actually, already there are more jobs, direct jobs in clean energy than there are in the oil sands here in Canada. And that's pretty impressive. Last year, $10.9 billion was invested in renewable energy in Canada. That's twice as what was invested in fishing, forestry, and agriculture combined. So it's already happening here in Canada. It's employing people. It's creating investment. People are employed in this industry. But this goes back to the narrative. And what do we think of ourselves in Canada? And do we even know, do even us in this room who care know that we're actually making progress? And we don't, um, you know, some of, some of us know, but we are making progress, which is impressive. Um, the challenge we have before us is all about politics. And Peter referenced, you know, politics is power. And, um, you know, political power is necessary. That's what you said, Peter. Political power is necessary to make this change happen. And so uh, I agree with Miles about, you know, we need to wake up. We need to wake up and really think about who's going to be leading this country after October 19th. Because it's leaders like Obama who have a vision of where we're going to go, a vision of 
you know, being the leader in clean energy and in out innovating the rest of the world, winning the clean energy race. And that's the kind of leader that we need to get in power here in October 19th. So the economists, the economics is one piece, the environment's the other piece, but I think the third piece of this conversation is the politics, and we need to get it right here in Canada. So, <clears throat> we're at a tipping point, legally, technologically, politically, and this is a preview of the discussion that we're going to have tonight, but first, you've all been very patient, and I'm sure people have animal needs, as David described, uh, to attend to. So we're going to take a quick intermission, then we're going, to come, we're going to come back and hear from Deanna Knight, and then we're going to get into this exciting dinner table conversation. Thanks so much.